This third video in the series is going to take you through the steps of assigning a task to a set of geochronology data, assigning common lead correction values, then visualizing that data in the SQUID3 environment. I have already imported my data and proceeded through the project and data menus as demonstrated in the earlier videos. A task, just like in SQUID 2.5, is how you define the ratios and calculations that you wish to carry out. There are three ways to create these tasks. Loading a pre-built one from the task library, loading a SQUID 3 task from your own custom library, which over time you will develop, or by importing an old SQUID 2.5 task. In this video, we are going to review the simplest of these three mechanisms using a task from the library. Just as in SQUID 2.5, the task needs to be matched with the species measured in the run table. And so for this demonstration, I'm using an XML file with the standard 10 peak run table. So that's masses 196 to 270. And that corresponds to one of the built-in tasks that came preloaded when you downloaded SQUID3. So I'll select that one there and I will use as current task. Please be patient while your task is loading. It might take a few moments longer than shown in this video. Once you've loaded your task, you'll come to the task manager window. Here in the task audit, you can verify that the species in your data file correspond to the species in your task. So there are the species in the data file and there are the species in the task. You can see here that these two sets of values are broadly the same, but because of the variability in the magnet calibration, the numbers don't match up perfectly. Also here, you can see what are the uranium lead directives specified in this task. These should look familiar to you as this is the information captured in the special uranium lead equations panel in the task editor of SQUID 2.5. You'll notice that there are some red X's beside these directive equations. And you'll remember how before I just mentioned that there's a discrepancy between the identification of the species in the data file and what's expected in the task. Well, that's the reason for these red X's and our next step is to rationalize the two. Again, when in doubt in SQUID 3, follow the blue breadcrumb trail uh, to get clues on what you should do next. So let's go to isotopes, map isotopes from data task. This is a busy window and I encourage you to read through it, but for this video, I'll just cut to the chase. Each species in your run table is listed along with its AMU setting off the magnet. Your task, however, has more generic labels for each of these species. In order for SQUID3 to recognize which of these species it should use in the task, the data isotope label and the task isotope label need to match. You do this by pressing the orange button below, which copies the task isotope labels onto your data isotope labels. You can check that you didn't misclassify something by checking this against the AMU column, which never changes. It's the original value from column D. Now that you've matched your data label to your task labels, if you go back to uh, view current task, you'll see that you have the green check marks beside the directives, which is what you're after, and you can now look at your data. One thing where you can check things out is the expression manager, which is a significantly enhanced version of SQUID 2.5's task editor, and it enables full end-to-end -end evaluation of thorium-led uranium geochronology data processing. There's an incredible amount of power in the expression manager and it will get its own video. For the moment, all you need to know is that if you're using a task from the library, you do not need to make any changes here, but you can use this window to interrogate the results of the outputs of all the expressions used in the task. Moving on through the menu then to common, the common lead menu, 
Here you can set the type of 204 overcount correction you wish to do. So use either the original 4-6 ratio or a overcount correction using 207 or using 208 using these dialog buttons here. You can then assign a common lead uh, composition to correct for each sample. So you can assign a composition using a model, using a Stacy Kramer's uh, composition at uh, a fixed age, or using a Stacy Kramer's composition tuned to the individual sample. And of course, you can always do different common lead composition corrections for different samples. The selected weighted mean age for each sample is shown in red. And if you change the common lead composition, you'll see that it changes the weighted mean instantly. You can also see, drop down the details for each sample to see the effect of your overcount correction or common lead selection on individual analyses. So there's the common lead composition and there are the ages, and if I change to a different common lead composition, you'll see these values change. So now the moment you've been waiting for, checking out your processed results. This is done via the interpretations menu. We'll start by reviewing the reference materials as a weighted mean. In this window, you can view a weighted mean of either the age or the calibration constant, alternating between these two dialog buttons here, uh, CC for calibration constant, or age. Spots can be deselected manually or using this auto reject checkbox up here. So if I deselect auto reject, I can uh, deselect individual analyses either using the checkboxes on the left or by selecting individual analyses on the diagram, right clicking, and toggling exclusion of the spot. You can also view your reference materials as uh, a Concordia. And you'll see the items that you had deselected in your previous weighted mean are remain deselected in the Concordia diagram and are shown as grayed out ellipses. You can also, pl also plot any two expressions for the reference material. A common one that you might wish to plot is the typical calibration relationship uh, lon lon lead uh, uranium and uranium oxide over uranium. And again, the items that were deselected in your weighted mean remain deselected in this diagram, and you can uh, apply a regression and show the, uh, the error envelope around that. Moving on to unknowns, those can also be plotted uh, on Concordia diagrams. These can be Wetherill or Tara Wasserberg diagrams. You can change uh, the color of the ellipses down here you can choose to plot the centroids or not. Using the scroll on your mouse, you can change the axes, and if you click on the plot elements, you can drag them to move them uh, around within those axes. This is essentially all the functionality that's presently available in the Concordia visualization of SQUID3. More complex plotting functions, for example, plotting subpopulations in different colors, are currently best addressed by exporting the data for treatment by other visualization packages, such as isoplot, but efforts are currently underway to enhance the functionality of this using the topsoil environment. You have a few more options in plotting weighted means of unknowns than you did for reference materials. So again, we'll move to OG1 as our example. You can plot the raw ages 
or the ages rather, or raw ratios or corrected ratios. Again, you can use the check boxes on the far left to deselect the analyses, or you can select it on the diagram, right click and toggle exclusion. You're able to set a threshold probability of fit and the data points will be excluded from the calculation of the weighted mean accordingly. You can also sort your data by a number of parameters. For example, if we go to raw ratios, you could sort the data by the 204 to a 6 ratio if you knew you had a high common lead analysis that you wish to exclude. Note that the value of the data that it's being sorted by appears to the right of the value that is being plotted in the left-hand part of this window. I'll also point out that this, on the diagram here, this is just sorting the data. It isn't using the value of that parameter on the x-axis. Now, in this window, there are a fairly limited number of parameters uh, shown here that you can either calculate a weighted mean from or sort. But in fact, you have 100% flexibility in what you can plot and sort in Squid 3, not just the options shown in this default view. I'll explain this further in the video on reports. Finally, you can extract the numeric outputs of the weighted means. So this array, the value, one sigma error, MSWD, etc., can be written to a CSV file using these orange buttons up here. I needed to save the squid file before it allowed me to do that. So again, I'll save the weighted mean stats to a new file, clicking on this button here. And this CSV file with the weighted mean information is saved by default to the folder where the .squid file lives. If you want to save multiple uh, weighted means, you do that by selecting a different weighted mean. So I saved the 638 age, now I want to save the 76 age, and I append that as well. So these weighted mean files are different CSV files for each individual sample. So now let's say I wanted to save the 207 corrected 738 age, but if I had not remembered whether or not I'd created one of these and I uh, said um, I wanted to make a new file, you will get this confirmation message box saying it appears that a weighted mean report already exists. Would you like to overwrite it? Which means do you want to wipe out the existing CSV and have another one that only contains the 76? a 207 corrected 638 age. I don't, I wish to append this to an existing file so I can say cancel and then append and it will write that age to this CSV file. We'll review the format of these numeric outputs in the video on reports.